Hi everybody, my name is Rob Clark. I work for Reality Gaming Group as the Head of Marketing and I'm here to talk to you about some of the things we've learned from Web3 that may help form some of your sort of decisions and thoughts around potentially moving into the space. Uh, and that's really who this talk is for. It's for traditional publishers and developers who are interested in Web3 overall. Uh, I'm not going to be talking in like big technical detail because I'm not a technical person, I'm a marketing guy. Um, but I do work for a company that has helped a lot of brands onboard into this space as well as making our own game, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so expect this to be real generalization and I will be making some statements that talk to what I think your audience is likely to be, which is more of a general mass audience that you need to produce and to find for a, a mobile game or even a desktop game, right? So a quick summary about us. I won't linger on this, but I think it's important for people to understand our position to sort of understand some of the stuff I say later on. So very quickly, uh, as I said, I'm the head of marketing. I come from a games background, so I've worked in video games and board games for uh, most of my career. Um, and just like me, uh, the company that I work for, RGG, has a games legacy as well. So we've been uh, working on games as, as, as this business since 2017 when we launched a game called Reality Clash which was a AR game that happened to feature NFTs and this was way before NFTs became a thing, right? Two or three years before the big explosion in NFT or even in blockchain technology being talked about in general. Um, and we happened to slide our way onto the App Store early before terms and conditions started changing the way that you can manage NFTs in the place. So. That's where Reality Clash came from. And then we built on that with a license with the BBC. And then we started helping brands work out um, how they could do the same thing as us, um, potentially from different entry points. Um, and we want to help those brands sort of engage with Web3 in a meaningful and, and, and consistent way, have a good long-term roadmap and really treat this like emerging space as, as something to, to really like get their teeth into. Um, just a little bit about our game, because I think that's probably the most relevant for what I'm going to continue to talk about for the rest of this presentation. Uh, Doctor Who Worlds Apart is a digital trading card game set in the Hooniverse, uh, where you own the cards. That's our quick elevator pitch. Um, it is a fairly uh, complex, uh, it, as far as like digital trading cards go. It sits somewhere between Hearthstone and Magic in terms of complexity. Um, we've released it into early access, our own early access, not on Steam because it's an NFT game. Um, but we released it into our early access in December. We announced it in 2020. Um, you know, sometimes working on this game, like I forget how big a license this is uh, for the sort of web free space. This is quite a, a huge license and actually for a brand entering the space, the BBC here, you know, what people may consider to, to be a typically conservative organization have actually come in and they've done the biggest step that I think you can do in the space, which is jumping into a web free uh, powered, an NFT powered game. Um, which we have built from scratch in, with an in-house team because we have that gaming legacy, right? Um, we've made over $3 million in the last couple of years on cards, tokens, and items. And that is before um, launch for a free-to-play experience, which shows you sort of the power of, of harnessing this technology can bring to you. I don't want to keep boring you before I get to the main bits, but I feel like I have to define Web3 a little bit because, you know, if, if anything says anything about the industry that I work in, it's that we can't even decide whether it's spelt Web3 uh, without a space or Web3.0 with a space. Um, everyone uses both. Um, I prefer Web3 without a space. I just think it looks cooler. Uh, but if you can imagine how, like, we can't quite decide on that, you can also work out like we can't really decide on an, a broader definition. There are lots, there are many very good technical definitions. Decentralization and ownership is sort of one method of defining stuff. Some people say that you have to log in with a wallet for something to be web free. I disagree with that. Um, my definition is a bit broader, right? I'm talking about any project that has some sort of blockchain powered element, you know, typically it is NFTs. Um, but we're talking about a really broad scope Right, so like um, Doctor Who is this sort of NFT powered video game, but also we're working on smaller like art projects which use NFTs, or we're talking about metaverse that doesn't necessarily even need an, an NFT integration at all. Um, but I am talking about the very broadest sense of the term Web3 when I talk about Web3 in the rest of this presentation. I hope that's clear. Now, on to some actual learnings, right? Um, okay, so we use the term we're early in, in crypto. Um, 
to sort of signify like, hey, you're getting on this now and you know, you're, you are getting on before the mass market gets on board, right? And it's generally considered to be, yeah, it's a good sentiment, right? You're early and people are coming on. Now, when you're a, an, an investor, when you put money into crypto or, 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 or buy NFTs, perhaps that, that is, is very much true, right? But when you are a developer, you've got to actually think about this uh, uh, actually from a, a, a higher up standpoint, right? A more top level conversation. And what we know is that the mass market is, is not quite there. Um, these figures change every five minutes, but talking very broadly, you're talking about 68 million people that have a wallet versus 2.6 billion people that play any sort of game. Um, that's a huge disparity. And although like wallet grow, wallet registrations uh, and ownership has grown exponentially in the last year, we've still got a great deal of catching up to do. And that's something to consider when you want to make a game and you want to target a large audience. So our challenge with Doctor Who and maybe your challenge of your brands or your challenge for any sort of game, right, is how are we going to talk to 100,000 or 250,000 or a million or 2 million people? Um, if you just throw wallets in front of people, they do get scared. Um, they they scare casual consumers much in the same way that I imagine if you walked into a, 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 any shop and sort of a, a, you want to be told, hi, welcome, how can we help you? And you sort of get told, hey, please get your debit card out so we can check to make sure you can afford this transaction and verify your identity. And that's not a pleasant user experience, right? Um, now, there are a million reasons and a million ways that you can say here, like, Rob, you're absolutely wrong. Um, this this is our Web3 project and it signs in with a wallet. And we also have Web3 projects that sign directly in with wallets. With Doctor Who, we don't because we don't want them to have that experience if they are a casual Doctor Who fan, if they are sort of a 60-year-old person who is into Doctor Who, um, but is even sort of new to games in general. Um, we don't want to then have the wallet stuff on top. That doesn't mean we don't have these Web3 features though. We have marketplace trading, we have auctions, we have peer-to-peer -peer functionality, we have the ability to take any one of our cards and export them to Polygon, to Binance, to Ethereum, to sell them on OpenSea. You know, we are true entities. We're not one of those businesses that has started up and just said, oh, look, we have done a token and it's on our system. That, that is not Web3. And that's where I sort of draw the definition in for us. But what I would say, the takeaway from this is, like, don't feel like you have to jump all in to do that, right? And when you were talking about whatever it is that your the NFTs allow you to do in your project, like focus on the features and keep the focus on the features. And I'll bring this back a few times in the rest of this talk, right? People don't care. You might care um, and your developers will certainly care, but the tech is not that interesting to the mainstream, right? So rather than saying, hey, we're an NFT game and here's what an NFT is and there's a you know a lot of NFT terminology and we have to start saying, an NFT is a non-fungible token, like it gets really dull uh, and it confuses people. Instead of that, we look at what our features are and how those are, ena are enabled through that tech. So we say instead, look, this is a game where you can go and you can take the cards that you buy and if you've got doubles or if you get a rare card, you can trade them. You can trade them with a friend on our marketplace or you can trade them anywhere else that you want to be able to trade. Just like if you bought a pack of Yu-Gi-Oh cards or Pokemon cards in a store, you can go and you can sell those on eBay if you want to. And that's exactly what we do. How we do it? NFTs. But what we do, it, it's just more exciting. And it's definitely something that, that uh, you can easily lose focus on when you're in a sort of a new space because we're all excited about it, but consumers aren't necessarily all excited about it when we talk about a mass audience. Um, and sort of talking about that sort of history a bit, like everything that it was important in games is still important. Um, might sound obvious to some people. It certainly isn't obvious in the space. There's a lot of stuff that it's clearly been developed by people with no gaming experience. And that can show, it can show quickly um, and it can show over a longer term when you don't have the sort of consideration towards the detail and the minutia and the sort of economics behind what you're trying to do. Um, and the thing is, right, Web3 is far easier to learn in its entirety, everything you need to know, smart contracts, all the tech, it's all easier to learn than game development, right? So if you already know game development, you can jump into Web3. If you only know Web3, you've got a, you've got a couple of degrees, right, to get through of, of game design and production and art and all the stuff that we know makes games take and become such complex projects. Um, 
Some businesses have survived going in that way. Most of the ones that are becoming successful and are growing now came in through games with that experience. Um, the other thing to talk about here is the concept of utility, which is something that you'll hear all the time from us web free people, which is, you know, does, does your entity have a point? Now, when you're doing a game, you don't have to worry too much about utility because the answer is yes. Um, hopefully you can answer with your feature set that we talked about before, like what is, what is it that you're trying to, um, to do with the tech? Um, and because you have that, and because you're making something, because you're experienced in games and you're making a game and you're using the tech for a good purpose, what you will find is you actually have, you actually are able to survive what people say, you know, is, is a big problem for Web3, which is market volatility. And in the case of market volatility, it's, it's all true. Um, no one can deny that recently we've had a massive dip in the price of Bitcoin. Everything else follows in the, in the crypto world and the NFT market as a whole also drops. Um, what hasn't dropped is the amount of Doctor Who fans. What hasn't dropped is the amount of people wanting to play a digital card game. What hasn't dropped is the desire for consumers to want to own items that they otherwise wouldn't own. So we have that sort of long-term market of our own because we have focused on a longer-term utility and a strategy as we build up. Um, and also don't confuse features for genres. One of the uh, critical mistakes I think Web3 has er made early in gaming is that it's, confu it's confused play to earn as a genre of game, whereas play to earn is a feature that may pop up in a game. Uh, and if you look at it that way, you can you sort of get a, 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 an understanding really of how strange it can be when you have teams saying, okay, well, it's a play, they'll, they'll do the elevator pitch as it's a play to earn game. Um, yeah, but what is it? What's the game? Um, and it shows how much the focus is on the commercial side, but the foundation of a good quality game that's going to actually spur those economies to make people stay and make people um, want to be a part of it. They're not there. And there's nothing wrong with play to earn. Like ultimately, Doctor Who will be a play to earn game the minute we give an NFT away as a ranking up, for example, because that NFT is sellable. So arguably, um, it's a play to earn game, but we would never pitch it as a play to earn game because it's just one part of it. Maybe it comes on the feature set at some point, but you wouldn't. You can make money selling Pokemon cards, but Pokemon don't pitch Pokemon as a play to earn experience. Um, so, so why would we, right? And then in many cases, why would you? Um, so next one, um, you really need to think about the market and accessibility. Um, and when I talk about accessibility, I am talking about sort of financial accessibility and the way that things fit together on a range. So for example, um, we have a larger range of potential consumers and, and markets that we can tap. Um, when we talk about, um, sorry, my dog is drinking water, I'm sorry if you can hear that. He doesn't care that I'm doing a presentation. Um, you might see him in the background wandering about as well. Um, so we talk about range uh, of money, right, uh, and of, of entry points into your ecosystem. And I think the big difference between this and a casual or, or a mobile free-to-play experience that isn't NFT-based is that there, there are bigger differences. So we sell uh, that coin there, which is called a founder's token for Doctor Who. And that gives you access to a whole bunch of things, airdropped cards. It gives you access to 0% commissions on trades, um, which is a really big one for our community. Uh, it gives you access, early access into the game. And it gives you access to special Discord, loads and loads of stuff, right? Important point to mention here is that we started selling these at $200, $250. We now sell them at $1,000 uh, on a tiered release of um, a set amount. Now, for a transaction in a mobile game, $1,000 is usually considered incredibly excessive, right? But these are far more than a microtransaction. They are a ticket into a community. And that's where Web3 can build and can offer this value because you're sort of buying into the success of the game. These tokens, because they are sellable, they will increase in value if the game market does well and if the game performs well overall. So that's one end, right? And it's a higher end than potentially you might be used to in mobile or, or, or certainly in like desktop games, right? A $1,000 microtransaction would seem excessive. But a $1,000 dollar microtransaction in a normal game is not something that you own or something that you become a part of. So you have this this upper range, but you've still got to keep in mind that mass audience, right? Um, what we've found is that 
you want to have a good level of tiers. With Doctor Who, we have a very basic entry tier, which is five dollars for a pack of cards, and those are the that's the only thing you have to buy to get new cards for the gameplay mechanics. We have frames, which are aesthetic, and they cost more, and then we have this token, which is um, brings everything together for for really enthusiast buyers, right? Um, and these tiers work better on Web3 when they have multiple purpose and when they have mobility. So an example of multiple purpose for us is that the Founders Token, yes, it gives access to 0% commissions for the holders of it. But if you're not a holder, having these uh, people in within our ecosystem means that they are significantly encouraged to you know, give the marketplace liquidity and bring cards onto the market and trade more because they have that advantage in not having to to pay what is a five percent commission that they pay nothing on. Um, it, so that actually the whole player base benefits from that benefit from the token holders. It doesn't have a de detrimental effect. It has a positive one. And when we talk about mobility, what we simply mean here is can you work out a way for, if you have a tiered system, if you have token holders and regular players, maybe 95% of your regular players don't care, don't even notice. But there will be a, a certain percentage which will want to be token holders but will not want to spend the money. But you can encourage them through competitions. We did a tournament recently where we gave away free founders tokens. Um, and we do competitions and of other types and, and cross collabs where founders tokens are up for grabs. So so there's always a chance, even if you don't want to pay the money, that you could be a part of that side of the community. And there's, there's always that, what we'd call a sort of upward mobility for it. Uh, the next thing I sort of want to talk about, we'll get into the more esoteric elements of Web3 now, um, is sort of collaboration and what that sort of means for uh, what, what the difference between this feels like for, for, for me uh, compared to traditional gaming, right? So we talk about decentralized tech and like decentralized uh, tech is cool. It's, it's interesting from a software perspective, right? It's not, again, going back to what the feature is, right? It's not, it's not a feature. The feature of that is a greater sense of ownership and a greater sense of collaboration. Um, we talk about this word, which you've probably heard before from Web3 people, which is interoperability, uh, which simply means like the ability for us to connect um, different networks and different items and, and bring them together. And, and this whole idea of decentralization lets us, uh, and, and, and true digital ownership lets us do that effectively for the first time. Although, you know, it, there, are, there have been companies that have been trying to do this for many, many years. Uh, the common idea of interoperability sort of comes uh, with the example of like, okay, I buy my in-game item from game A, and then I can use that in-game item in game B. Now, this is a thing where you sort of, you, you get a lot of the conversation about uh, interoperability becoming, well, it's not possible. There's no way that, you know, EA, are going to let their in-game item uh, be something that's usable on, on Ubisoft, not only for licensing reasons, but because of the development times. And I, like, I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily think that's untrue as of 2022, but this is where Web3 actually is really exciting to me because I think in three, four or five years, when we have these entrenched Web3 gaming companies, that's exactly what people are going to want to see. And it's, it will become a, at such a, a point that the money is there to fund that idea of interoperability across into gameplay items, right? So um, I, I really see that becoming the future of the tech as we move forwards. Um, I like to think of it as uh, avatars today and gameplay tomorrow. And what I mean when I say that is we have... Um, Avatars coming into Doctor Who uh, at some point this year that will be, some of them will be NFTs and they will be tradable just like our cards and every other item in the game. Now, I think it's very feasible that we will be able to work with other web free developers who also use an avatar system. And okay, maybe their avatar system uses different different specs, right? Different resolution, different uh, color palette, different style. Maybe they have a flat shaded style and we use pixel art. Um, so we would then have to go and partner with that company and get their spec and then have our developers and our, our artists produce to their spec and then have it in. And you sort of might consider like, okay, well that's 
a significant cost and it is a significant cost but also if you're partnering with the right people um, and you're bringing in and you're bringing those communities closer together and you're getting closer as two businesses and two games can um, we could see that actually being worth the cost and the minute you make something like this worth the development time there's no reason not to do it so I think that we will start seeing this happening but I completely do think that it is something that isn't quite happening right now with the end consumer part of the deal. I mean, when it comes to the tech, it's happening constantly. Bridges are constantly being created. Um, if you want a, a, an evidence of Web3 really taking this on, that's not sort of lip service and, and sort of dreams of the future, just have a look at how many of the chains work together, how many of them bridge, how many of them build uh, and, and, and with that mindset, and it is a mindset, and it is a different mindset to the traditional gaming mindset. So it's something that I think the the, the gaming audience have a little bit of a harder time thinking is, is possible, but I think it's not just possible. It's one of the most exciting things about working in Web3 right now. Finally, community is important. And I think we've been saying that since uh, the internet existed, right? community is really important. It only gets more important with Web3. Um, Discord is the bread and butter, of course. There are other things that form around it, but Discord is the main point of, of, of the main area in most Web3 communities. Some, I think, may still use Telegram. But this is a funny thing for me, actually, because Web2 sort of took away community. Um, I don't think that Web3 has invented this idea of closer communities with more collaboration and, and more of a personal feel and a closer connection to, to, um, to, to people within it. I think the difference between Web3 is that they've connected it to, what well, we've been able to connect it to brands and to companies and to developers and to publishers in a way that we've never done before. But actually, like anyone that is over the age of, I'd say, maybe like 35, will probably remember, especially anyone that was growing up as a teenager when the internet happened, like I was, um, like we had communication methods like ICQ and ILC, um, that, and AOL chat rooms, um, which I started to talk on um, when I was a kid. And they, um, they feel a lot like the Discord communities of today. And I'm so glad to see us bringing that back because when we went away to Web2 and the internet got sort of homogenized into sort of, okay, you're on Reddit or you're on Facebook and that's really the internet in your eyes. Um, and even like, even modern social media like TikTok, it, it de that there are there are broad TikTok communities, but there's not that closeness that that we had back in the '90s. And finally, we're seeing that again. And I think that's a really important thing to sort of tap into. It's also a difficult thing to tap into for a lot of businesses. It's not actually that difficult for anyone that's worked in games because games has known that community is vital uh, and that being close to your fans and your consumers really close is vital. Um, we've known that for a long time. I think it, we, we, we always knew in games, even before sort of the advent of, of social media, but we really learnt it in the Kickstarter era, right? So, and I think, and, and the early access era, let's say, right? So, and, and that's what these communities, again, they, they feel a bit like those communities that grow up on steroids. And I think the reason it, for that is that you, you are both offering more and receiving more back in that relationship. So it becomes a lot closer, um, which is really the point of Web3, right? It's this collaboration. We've talked about collaboration with um, businesses uh, to, to achieve interoperability, but cl collaboration with your consumers through things like governance and DAO schemes, which I have not got the time to sort of cover in, in, in such a broad presentation today. Um, they're the collaboration between business and, and fan and gaming gets it already. When you have a Kickstarter where people have given money, you are, you know, you have a obligation, uh, obligation is probably the wrong word because it's kind of a negative word, I suppose, but you have an, an involvement and a different relationship with that fan, with that player um, than you would have done otherwise. And games so naturally can evolve into the Web3 side. There isn't that many differences. Um, 
I think the one key difference that people will find moving from traditional games into Web3 is, in terms of community, is how much um, communities are open to, guess that, collaboration, right? So they have, um, we, we, we have communities now that like, they speak to each other and they don't, they aren't sort of ashamed by it. And I think certainly back when I was working full time in games, uh, when we had Discord communities for, for products, it was really just, this is the community for this. And we don't really want to actively encourage people sharing other communities and, and getting, getting those sorts of links um, in. With crypto, that's really like, there is, there is a wider, broader, more, more traditional Web2 crypto community, and you'll find them on Reddit and Twitter, I suppose. And then you have the smaller communities, but the smaller communities are very aware of each other, perhaps because there's those like 100 million wallets uh, versus two, 2 billion gamers. It feels, in a way, even though 100 million people is a lot, it feels sort of more tight-knit, right? Um, and that is, that, that is certainly a key difference to how games discords were back five years ago. Um, and I think it's, it's something that's a little bit unique to the way that web free people think. Um, <laughs> that's it. So those were our like five, five quick, and as I said, very broad statements, I suppose you could call them from what we have picked up. And we are kind of a unique business. Um, well, not unique, I suppose, but we are uniquely placed working with uh, big brands, but also coming from games ourselves. We have an in-house development team. We don't outsource anything. So we've learned some of this stuff um, from scratch, really, uh, because, you know, experts come and go, but the industry is so new that actually um, many of us, I've been working at Reality for a year, and like that's probably half the time that the NFTs have been considered an industry in total, right? So everyone learns as they go. And I think the, the secret sixth um, tip, uh, piece of advice I have is that like anyone that fully claims to know exactly what they are doing in this space and, and has the secret to like guaranteed success are, are not telling the truth, right? We, we all learn as we go and we iterate and we improve sort of that process. So um, I'm gonna answer questions in chat. Um, and thank you very much for listening. If you want to connect, uh, Twitter is probably the best place to find me. I'm on LinkedIn if you search for um, Rob Francis Clark. Uh, if you want to talk about business stuff, I'm on rob at realitygamingroup.com. And you can find us at realitygamingroup.com on the internet. Um, thank you very much, guys. Have a good rest of the show and goodbye. <laughs>